Okay, well, welcome everyone to Hope Church this morning. We're going to be returning to our series in John's Gospel. We're going to the very center of Christianity. Last time we were thinking about the cross of Jesus, this week his resurrection. And uh, while we're talking about new life, um, we rejoice that uh, in the news that Elijah was born early on Saturday morning to uh, Kerry and Joe. It came at last. <laughs> so we're, we're delighted with that news. And then um, our meetings this week, we have our prayer meeting at 7.30 on Wednesday here in the chapel. And then next Sunday, just a reminder that the clocks move forward an hour, and, which means that if you forget, you'll either miss... Uh, most of the sermon or all of the sermon, depending on how late you usually are when you get here. But even if you do, it's actually okay because you get a second bite of the cherry because we have a Bible study as well next Sunday um, after uh, a bring your own lunch. So you'll still be able to get to something. Okay, now John uh, opens his gospel speaking of Jesus in this way. He says, in him was life and that life was the light of all mankind. And we're going to see at the end of his gospel, we see that life and light in the resurrection. We're going to see how morning light becomes an end to all mourning of the other sort when Jesus rises from the dead. And that's what we're going to sing about in our first uh, song this morning. See what a morning gloriously bright, you got the light, and there's this hope that comes because Jesus has risen from the dead. Let's stand and sing. Thank you. 
sit down. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that on that morning, everything changed. Death died, love won, Christ conquered. We thank you that your salvation plan was completed through the sacrificial death of your Son for sinners, through his resurrection from the dead to grant that new life to all who will trust in him. We thank you for the wonder of this plan given to those who do not deserve it. This is not what uh, you need to do for us. It is what you have chosen to do in your enormous love. And we pray, Lord, that we would know assurance through this. May we be confident that our sins really can and are forgiven in Christ, that he is a living saviour who stands by us, who can say, I have paid for their sin. And it's, we see the, the, the depth of your love, your commitment to your people. We see how nothing can separate us from the love of God when we look at the lengths that you went to in order to save us. We pray that we would have hope this morning. We read in your word that weeping endures for a night but joy comes in the morning. We thank you that that is the great message of your word. Yes, there is weeping now, but we thank you that there is an end to suffering. We thank you that there is truly hope. We thank you that there is restoration. Thank you for what we sung a couple of weeks ago. Nothing, there is nothing broken that you cannot repair. Thank you how we see that evidenced in the resurrection of your son. And we pray that we would have faith in you today. May we trust in the crucified and risen Christ. May we live in his light. We pray that we would be changed through his resurrection. May we be changed because there is a living Savior. Pray, Father, maybe that change needs to be that we would trust in him for the first time to see that Jesus is the Savior that I need. And where we have trusted him, we pray that we would live with a renewed confidence, a renewed joy, whatever the difficulties we may be facing, whatever the trials, but that we might have that confidence and joy because we follow a victorious living and reigning saviour. Thank you for just the enormous encouragement of the resurrection. Thank you that Jesus is alive, and we pray that that would transform how we worship, how we live. Help us today, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's come now to John's Gospel. Um, You'll notice from that first song we had, um, you'll see how some of the themes in that song are very much picked up in, in John's account of the resurrection. But it begins, very importantly, with the burial of Jesus. So we're going to pick up here from John 19, verse uh, 38. And sorry, you can see on here, page 766 in the Church Bibles. And it'll be helpful to follow it in there, but it'll be on the screen as well. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, because he feared the Jews. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who had earlier visited Jesus at night, Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus 
there. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they've put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth, which had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they've put him. At this, she turned round and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I'll get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. To be continued. Well, we've just read some incredible stuff. Is it just made up? Was it someone with a sort of overactive imagination a long time after Jesus was around, maybe in a different place, just concocted these stories? That's sometimes something you you hear. Maybe it's something you, you think yourself. And one of the things people might point to is they'll say, well, look, there's, you read these different accounts of Jesus' resurrection, they're all different. There's sort of contradictions between them. And uh, I don't want to dwell on this, but just, just very quickly, how many people, how many women were visited the tomb right at the beginning when it was still dark? What does John tell us here? In verse... Uh, what would you think from verse 1? One, yeah, okay, because it, it names one, doesn't it? Mary Magdalene. In the other Gospels, we read of other women also being with her. So, which is it? Well, have a look in verse 2. What does Mary say to Peter and the other disciple? How many people don't know where Jesus has been put? It says we, doesn't it? So John just mentioned by name Mary Magdalene, but Mary, even in her reported speech, is clear there were other people with her. So, yes, the counts are different. I'm not sure they're contradictory. But, but what I want to focus on is something slightly different here. Because... If you um, made all this up later on, maybe in a place a long way from Israel, how would you get all the names right? Let's just, let me explain what I mean by that. Can we just have a look through what we've read, and can you just tell me some of the people that have been mentioned, some of the names that we've had in this reading? Simon Peter, any, 
Nicodemus, thank you. Joseph, it's not just Joseph, is it? Joseph Arimathea, we'll, we'll come back to why that matters. Who else? Pilate, Mary Magdalene, and um, if you go back uh, just into the previous chapter, um, in verse, to chapter 19, verse 25, there's another Mary, Mary the wife of Clopas, and then in verse 19, what was written on the cross of Jesus? It says king of the Jews, but who's king of the Jews? Right, it's not Jesus, it's Jesus of Nazareth. So these are, those are all, I think, the names we've mentioned so far, all in, this, uh, all in this account of the resurrection. And names are things that people tend to sort of forget. You don't remember names very easily over time, but it gives lots of names here. Now, we're going to ignore Pilate because he wasn't Jewish, and if you were making all this up later, it's not really a surprise that you would know the name of the Roman governor. You know, you'd, you'd expect people to get that right. So let's just leave Pilate out of it. But there's something very interesting about the other names there. So let me ask this question. If, as, at school, do, do any of you, are any of you in, in a class where you have two children with the same name? Or maybe in the same year, Yeah. What, what, what's the same name? Sorry? A lot of people are called David. Great, yeah. So how do you, how does, so if the teacher says, you know, David come to the front, what, what, how, how, how do people know which one you mean? They say their surname. Great. So you have to say something else so you know which David you're talking about. Well, if you look at these list of names here, it's very interesting because we're not just told it's Joseph, it's Joseph of Arimathea. That's, that's a place. It's not just Mary, it's Mary Magdalene. It's not Simon, it's Simon Peter. And then there's another Mary. So even here you can see there's two Marys, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and it's Jesus of Nazareth. And when you look at, um, you, can, you can look at other records from the time of the names that people had in Israel at this time. And from that sort of analysis, you know, hundreds and hundreds of names, you discover that Simon is actually the most common uh, male name. So you can see why you need to distinguish which Simon you're talking about. Joseph is the second most common name. We know of another Joseph, don't we, in the Gospels, the, the, uh, the, the, the wife of Mary, the father of Jesus. The name Jesus, or, or Joshua, really, is the sixth most common name. So if you said, have you heard, have you heard Jesus? People would say, well, which Jesus? Oh, Jesus of Nazareth, you know, the carpenter. Oh, right, that one. You need to be clear who you're talking about. Nicodemus is rather different. That wasn't a very common name. So he's just given that on his own. Mary was the most common female name. So if you look at all the, um, if you look at all the names in, in the different Gospels and in the Book of Acts, and you compare that to what were the most... Uh, to all the names that you have from, from other um, literature at the time, you get an incredibly close match. That you get, of the nine most common male names, you get um, about 40... Um, sorry, this is going to get complicated, isn't it? I'm doing maths. But um, about 40%, 40... If you had 100 people, 40 of them would have one of those nine common names. And you discover in the Gospels and in Acts, it's actually about the same number about 40 out of 100 have those same common names. Now, my point is, how on earth could you get that right? If you were writing this later in a different place, how would you get this right with all the names? Because popular names change. When I was at school, there were quite a lot of people called Stephen. 
there aren't so many people, I think, called Stephen today. Interestingly, we've had a, just had an Elijah born. Well, apparently, there was another Elijah on, on the same ward. Now, I don't, I don't can't remember anyone called Elijah when I, was, uh, when I was growing up at school, but that's obviously now a more popular name, and that's just in, well, a few years, a few decades. So names change over time, and also what people are called in different places is different. Names in different countries. I don't know what... I don't even know what the most common names in France are. Uh, I certainly don't know what the most common names in France were 50 years ago. And in fact, Jews living in other places tend to have a very different pattern of names. So what we find here is that in the Gospels, we have what fits eyewitness accounts. They get these names right because these were the people that were actually there. These were actually the people, often many of them, part of the church that were passing on what they heard, what they saw. So these, what we read here in these Gospels is history. These are real events. So when you hear people at school saying, oh, this was all just passed down lo loads of times, it's all totally unreliable, well, if you actually read what's there and actually look at this, that is utter rubbish. These documents are, in, um, are recording real history. And uh, that's just a, a tiny little taster of some of the things we could, we could point to. If you want some uh, sort of uh, a fuller uh, basis of, of the sort of evidence why we can trust the Gospels, I'd really recommend this book, um, partly because uh, he's a friend of mine, he was the best man at my wedding, Pete Williams, great book, Can We Trust the Gospels? Very readable, very great help in just realizing that what we have here is real stuff. And that matters because our life depends upon what is recorded here. We can trust what God has said. And that's what we're going to sing about in this next song. From the breaking of the dawn to the setting of the sun, I will stand on every promise of your word. Let's stand and sing.
down. The next couple of things will uh, be familiar if you've been here the last couple of weeks. Um, I'll just go through these very quickly, but for people who maybe haven't heard this before, the Save to Surf conference is for uh, young people aged 15 to 25. I don't know who that includes here, uh, but you're, there's still, uh, well, you need to be get on and book for that basically um, ASAP. That's next Saturday uh, in Highbury. And then a reminder, we have our Easter stall on Saturday, Easter Saturday, day before Easter, 8th of April, in the Thamesgate Centre. This was us last year. Um, we've got, got some volunteers on the sheet at the back. It's always good to have uh, as many helpers as possible. That helps to um, encourage a, a crowd of people to come and have a look. Uh, we also need, um, again, if people still have ideas uh, for the craft as well, that also helps to attract people along. And we have uh, these uh, invitation cards, which uh, we'll be giving out at the stall. We'll also try and distribute some of these in the streets around the chapel. But these are also, if you want to be able to give these to neighbours, friends, work colleagues, people on the bus, whatever, um, please use uh, these as, as much as you can. There's a box full of these on the table at the back. Well, let's just come to God in prayer once more. Let's um, pray for Kerry and Joe and Elijah and Solomon, uh, and also pray for the church uh, in Bordeaux that we seek to support here. Uh, some of the offerings that we give here go towards the work of the church in Bordeaux, and there's been a, a prayer letter, there's a prayer letter available on the back with an update on some of the news there. And, they, and uh, Demelza is uh, due to have a baby in April, so let's uh, pray for them in that as well. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the safe birth of Elijah. We thank you for the miracle of new life. And we do pray that you would watch over Kerry. We pray that you would strengthen her and heal her. Pray that you would watch over the whole family. Pray that you would uh, help Joe. Pray that you would help Solomon in adjusting to this. And we pray that both Solomon and Elijah would grow up to be servants of you, to live for you and serve you all their days. May your blessing be on that family, we pray. And we pray too, Lord, for Bordeaux. We do pray for new life there as well. We pray for people to be born again of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you for the ministry amongst the students there. We thank you for this uh, Christianity Explored group that meets on a Friday night. And we pray, Lord, that students would come along. Pray, Father, that people that have promised to come would turn up. Pray that other things wouldn't get in the way. And pray, Lord, that that would be not simply out of sort of politeness, but out of a hunger that you have planted in their hearts to know the Lord Jesus as their saviour. We pray, Lord, that you would embolden those Christian students that there are, embolden them in their witness in a, in a culture where they will so often be misunderstood and indeed face opposition. Pray that you would embolden their witness and help Maxime in the training that he is doing to be able to be more involved in university life. We pray, Lord, use the contacts he's making through that Encourage him, Lord, in those labours and help them as a family 
We do pray for Demelza. We do pray that you would give her strength in these final weeks of the pregnancy. We pray that you would keep her and the baby safe. And we pray that you would encourage the whole family together. Encourage them as a small church. Show them that they are in the hands of a living and reigning saviour. May they be encouraged by the resurrection too, we pray. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to have a second reading from God's Word this morning. Isn't it a great thing that we can hear God's Word directly? It's not coming fallibly through me. This is the real deal. And we're going to read from the beginning of Genesis. And as we read this, I hope you can begin to see some connections to what we were reading in John earlier. So this is the beginning of the Bible. Genesis 1, from verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. Then at verse 31, and God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, and no shrub of the field had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent, rain, yet not sent rain on the earth, and there was no man to work the ground, but streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is Pishon. It winds through the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. Aromatic resin and onyx are also there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris. It runs along the east side of Ashur. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. See Adam's job? He was a gardener come to that. Okay, we're going to sing, sing once more, and um, then uh, during this will be time for the, for, for the younger ones to go to junior church. We're going to sing this hymn of Isaac Watts, um, written around 300 years ago, that contains, I think, two of, of the most sort of theologically rich lines ever written. Look at what he says in verse 5. In him, in Christ, the tribes of Adam boast more blessings than their father lost. If you remember nothing else from this morning, remember that, because that's basically what we're going to be doing next. Let's, let's stand and sing. Jesus shall reign where I the sun.
The earthquake in Turkey and Syria last month lasted around 80 seconds. That's actually quite long for an earthquake. But the devastation will take years, no, in fact, decades, to rebuild. It's so much easier to cause destruction than to repair it. It can take seconds, can't it, to write uh, an impulsive text, a, a social media post, but it's able to destroy your reputation or maybe someone else's for a very long time. It's very hard to undo that damage. One act of unfaithfulness can destroy a marriage. How can you undo that? How can you undo the past? How can you put things right? It's difficult, sometimes impossible. But whatever, it's going to take a long time. It's so much easier to destroy than to rebuild, to break than to repair, to make a mess than to clean it up. And it's also easier to make something new, to start from scratch, than to restore or repair what was there before. You're sitting in a great example of this. This is what the chapel looked like 30 years ago. It would have been a lot easier to just demolish the whole thing and just build a new building. But uh, as a listed building, we weren't allowed to do that. So we've had to work on it, improve on it, and restore it. And what we find in the Bible is a restoration project. God's rescue both for people and the planet, for creation. When you think about it, it, it took one act of disobedience, one act that is described in one chapter of the Bible, to bring destruction. Through the actions of the ancestor of every one of us, the actions of that first man, Adam. If you like, it took one man to destroy, that was easy. Well, it's taken one man, who is God, Jesus Christ, to rescue, to restore, to undo the damage. And that, if you like, is what the whole rest of the Bible is really all about. Many more chapters, that's something much harder, and it's something much more wonderful. It's harder, isn't it, to clean up someone else's mess, but that is exactly what Jesus does for us. Why? Well, think of that program on the telly, the repair shop. Why do people take those items to get them repaired? It's not often that they're particularly valuable in and of themselves. It's that they care about that object. It has some value because of family history or something or whatever. It means something to them, so they want it repaired. Well, that's really the message of the Bible. It's that even though you are guilty, even though you are at fault, even though you are part of the problem, God hasn't given up on you. God cares about you and wants to restore you. You can be part of his restoration project that is achieved through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is what God specializes in. John's gospel begins with Jesus as the creator. In the space of six days, he turns what is formless and empty and lifeless into a world of order and beauty, fullness and life. That's quite an impressive working week, isn't it? What did you get done this week? Well, that's what Jesus did in that first week of creation. But then at the end of the gospel, in a way, there's something even more remarkable. Because Jesus bears the curse on sin. That's what we looked at two weeks ago. And then he begins the work of restoration, of recreation in his resurrection. And if you like, what is so incredible is that Jesus doesn't merely undo the damage of sin, undo the damage that Adam brought, just get you back to where you started. He improves on it. He gives us something that is better 
than Eden. It is what we have just sung there together. In Christ, the tribes of Adam boast more blessings than their father lost. That is something so incredible about the gospel. So let's look at what's going on here in John's account of the resurrection. We see history going in reverse. If you've been here every week, this will be familiar. John is describing these real events in a way that makes us see a pattern and see a pattern of how Jesus is putting Genesis 1 to 3 into reverse. Jesus here is like Adam. What we've seen in in previous weeks, in chapter 18, Jesus is arrested outside the garden. There's swords and flames like those cherubim at the end of Genesis 3 where Adam is outside the garden. Jesus is put on trial, like Adam. Pilate says, behold the man, unwittingly echoing the very words we find in Genesis. Jesus is called a king. Well, that's what Adam was. Adam was made to rule over God's creation. The Jewish leaders say that Jesus must die because he was claiming to be God, which is really what Adam's sin was. And then we see Jesus bears the curse, the consequences of sin. He has a crown of thorns on his head. His clothes are removed at the cross. He toils and sweats in the torture of the cross. And he dies physically as the wages of sin. His side is opened, like Adam, to give life to his bride. The cross is a tree of life that we can access outside Eden. But then look what we find in the reading we had today. Something we only find in John, John 19, verse 41. We discover that at the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden. No one else mentions that. Jesus' body is placed almost planted in the ground in this garden. What do we read in Genesis 2? Adam is made from the dust of the ground, and he's not made in the garden. He's made outside the garden, and then we're told twice there in Genesis, he is placed, he is put into Eden. And who does Mary think that Jesus is initially? She thinks he's a gardener. Well, that's what Adam was placed in the garden to do, wasn't it? To work it and to take care of it. In other words, Jesus is like Adam, except he's like Adam by being different to him. Because Jesus obeys. He doesn't hide. He doesn't shift blame, but takes responsibility. Adam is guilty. Jesus is innocent. Adam brings death. Jesus brings life. And the only person who can do that is God. So Jesus, not only does he act here as Adam, Jesus is also the creator. You see, he's a lot more than a gardener caring for creation. He made the creation. He makes light. And did you notice in Genesis 1, it's not morning and evening, it's evening and morning. Because there's this pattern that God has throughout Scripture of darkness to light. And we see the same thing in John. Judas goes out to betray Jesus at night. And darkness envelops, really, chapters 18 and 19. Jesus is arrested. It's in the dark. He crosses the Kidron Valley. That means dark. He's tried at night. And then when the burial is described, it's at at nightfall. It's Friday evening. And John even reminds us about Nicodemus, that he was the guy that visited Jesus at night. And even Sunday begins with Mary in the dark. But then the sun, the S-O-N, rises. The Son of God rises. The one who is light to the world who is the light of the world, the one who John describes as the true light. So evening turns to morning. 
and the other sort of mourning turns to joy, all through Jesus' resurrection. We saw how Jesus completed uh, his work on the sixth day. He completes creation on the sixth day. And on the sixth day, he calls out from the cross, it is finished. Then what does he do? He rests, like we read in Genesis 1. He rests on the Sabbath, on the Saturday. And he rises on the first day of the week. John mentions this twice in chapter 20. It's early on the first day of the week. That's actually an odd thing to say. You would expect John to say, on the third day, because Jesus had taught previously about rising on the third day. But he doesn't. He calls it the first day of the week. If you like, it's the eighth day. It's a new era. It's a new creation. It's new life. Jesus is the creator. I want you to just grasp how incredible this really is. When you think about it, our lives, our world, all of history, there's one direction of travel. It's from life to death. We're celebrating the birth of a new baby today. There's new life. But just and the totally inappropriate thing to say, but it's every new life is on a path to death. That's just a fact, a reality. Cemeteries only fill up. They get full. They never empty. They never get smaller. Well, Jesus puts that in reverse. Jesus has discovered that death has a reverse gear. And so you have a change of pattern. Now death goes to life. The cemetery empties. That is what is happening here. That is incredible. But the question is, how do you get that new life? And what is that new life like? Well, first of all, how do you get that new life? Well, we need to understand this happens through the cross. This new life of resurrection is is linked to Jesus' death on the cross. And this is what is so important about Jesus' burial. This isn't just padding. The burial is really crucial because it links Jesus' crucifixion to his resurrection. And it sort of makes us pause. Normally what would happen to people who had been crucified, particularly if they'd been crucified on the charge of rebellion against Rome, which is what Jesus was, they weren't, their bodies weren't buried. They weren't even given to, to family. They were basically just left to the vultures to eat. So Joseph here was taking quite a risk in associating himself with Jesus, who'd come under this charge of sedition, in asking for the body. And there's a wonderful detail here. This is, this is an example of one of these undesigned coincidences I, we've talked about before. In in Mark's gospel, he makes this incidental comment when he talks about Joseph. He says, he went boldly to Pilate, or he he took courage as he went to Pilate. Why does he say that? Why does he make that sort of little detail? Well, John tells us, because John is saying he was someone who was a disciple secretly out of fear of the Jews. So if you like, Mark is pointing out, and look, he's, he's taking some courage here in doing this. And in Matthew's gospel, we find that Joseph was someone very rich and also that it was his tomb that he had cut out of the rock that he was now using. That explains how he was able to do all this at such short notice. You know, how do you get permission from someone to use their tomb in in the sort of tightness of the time schedule here? And it also explains the enormous amount of spices and perfume that's talked about here, 75 pounds In the footnote there, 34 kilograms. I once had a suitcase that was 34 kilograms. I remember there was a warning label on it to the baggage handlers. Um, It's it's heavy. This is something excessive. That is the sort of amount of of spices and stuff you would use for a king. So this this was a serious burial. And why were you using those spices, that perfume? Well, it wasn't embalming. It wasn't like the Egyptians. You're not trying to preserve the body. Rather, you're trying to deal with the smell, 
the smell of decomposition. Because these tombs would be used multiple times. They're, they're obviously hard work to cut a tomb out of rock. So often these tombs would contain several bodies. And you would wait for the, for the body to decay, and once the body had decayed, you would remove the bones and put them in a box. Either leave them in the cave or put them somewhere else. That was a sort of two-stage burial you would have. And that's where the details recorded here matter so much. Because the way Jesus was buried, it means there is no room for confusion. The body of Jesus was taken off the cross and it was placed in a new tomb. In other words, there were no other bodies. So if that body has now gone, it has to be the body of the same Jesus who died on the cross. It's eliminating potential for error, for confusion, for a mistake. But there's a, a sort of deeper lesson here in connecting the, the, the resurrection to the cross through the burial. That resurrection life only comes through the cross. Jesus was, was incarnated. He was born as Adamic humanity, i.e. like us. He had a body like ours, a body that could hunger and thirst, that could know exhaustion and pain, and that could die. But he is raised to a different type of physical life. We're going to come to that in a moment. Where there is no more death or mourning or crying or pain. It's a different form of physical existence. So if you like, he's raised as something slightly different to how he was born. And my point is that the only route to doing that, to this new life that was better than what Adam knew, the only route to that is via the cross. It is not something you can get to without the cross. And I'm not going to take, I'm not going to get distracted on this now, but there are, that actually is really important uh, for all sorts of uh, different teachings you get around today, particularly in the creation debate. Look at what jo Paul says in Philippians. Talking of Jesus, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. He became obedient to death, even death on a cross. And it doesn't then say, but, you know, that, that was bad, but it's all right, God exalted him. It says, therefore, God exalted him to the highest place. It's precisely because he went to the lowest point, to the full depths of death, returning to the dust of the ground where he could go no lower as a human being. It's precisely because he went to those depths that he is then raised to this new kind of life, to this new exaltation. It is through the cross. There was no other way. And so you see the incredible cost of what Jesus has done in his triumph over sin, in paying the penalty for sin in behalf of sinners. On behalf of sinners, he has, he has gone to these depths so that he can be exalted. But it's not just for Jesus. You see, not everyone shares in Jesus' resurrection life. This isn't just something automatic that all of us here will enjoy. It doesn't just happen to everyone. You can only enjoy this via the cross. Or let me put it like this, Jesus' resurrection does you no good unless you go to his cross for forgiveness. If you simply say, well, I'm, I'm a decent person, I'm a good person, I, I, I'm involved in church, I'm fine as I am, you will not benefit from Jesus' resurrection. To be raised with him, you need to die with him which means you need to humble yourself before God to be able to say that my sin put him on the cross. I'm wrong. God's judgment is right. And I'm turning from my sin to trust in Christ, asking for forgiveness, not because I'm a special case, but because Jesus died for my sin. 
He bore the curse in my place as my king. That is the only route to benefit from the resurrection. And that opens up a path to a new future. A future that isn't a return to the present or even to Eden before sin. It's something even better. This new future is something physical but different. The body was gone from the tomb. The tomb was empty. And this wasn't robbery. The grave clothes were left behind. That would be an odd thing to do if you were simply taking the body. But more importantly, Jesus was seen. Not a vision, not a ghost, not an angel. I mean, remarkably, the one person who doesn't shine here is Jesus. I mean, if you were making this up, you would make Jesus the sort of glowing figure. You have angels that shine. Jesus doesn't. In fact, it's, it's bizarrely ordinary. He, he appears in such a way that Mary can mistake him for the gardener. You wouldn't make that up, would you? And he talks. He doesn't just say a word. He has an extended conversation. He's someone you can touch. We read in other accounts how he eats with the disciples. And it's the same Jesus, the same person who taught the crowds and who died on the cross. You could... You, he was recognizable. He even had these nail marks in his hands. So there is sort of continuity. This is, this is the same person, and yet he is different. He is not immediately recognized. In chapter 21, even, the disciples still seem slightly unnerved by Jesus as to, because he is, he is just different. And he appears in a locked room, and he rises in such a way that the grave clothes are left behind. They're not sort of unwrapped. It's as if his body just passes through them. So this is not resuscitation. This is not Jesus back to where he was before he died, back to where you start. It's something different to what we read earlier in John with Lazarus. You see, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Lazarus came out with the grave clothes and he would one day need them again because he would die. Jesus doesn't need the grave clothes. You even have this faith cloth that is folded or rolled up as if it's sort of put away to the side because we don't need this anymore. It's an upgrade. So it's a sort of physical existence that's sort of compatible with our world. Jesus could be part of it. He could eat. He could do things in this world. And yet it has sort of extra features. It's a bit like a sort of software upgrade where the sort of old versions are still compatible with it. It's an upgrade to eternal life. What Jesus had promised Nicodemus. An eternal life isn't just, isn't, well, it isn't never-ending existence. It's not just sort of life as it is now going on and on and on. That wouldn't be great, would it? It's not some sort of reincarnation either. But it is sharing in the physical resurrection life of Jesus in a new creation. That is what resurrection life is. That's what eternal life is. In other words, you're in a position that is better than Adam was before he sinned. You see, in this future resurrection life, we are united to Jesus in such a way that we cannot sin. We cannot mess it up anymore. Well, that's quite something, isn't it? Because it's all down to him. And it's his life that sustains you. And you'll never be bored, because for a whole eternity, there will be more and more to discover of Jesus' goodness and love and glory. And this isn't going to be in some sort of spiritual heaven, but in a physical new earth. In other words, God hasn't given up on creation. The word became flesh. And he stays flesh in his resurrection. He stays flesh forever. And there is such an important lesson from this. 
creation matters. The physical matters. Our bodies matter. Think of the care given to Jesus' body in death. Well, how much more should we care for it in life? And yet it's something that our culture struggles with. We struggle with our sort of bodily identity. Things like transgender ideology, even eating disorders, are really sending a message that the body is bad, what God has made. But what Jesus does here counteracts that. And yes, understand this, our our bodies don't function just like the rest of creation. They they don't always function as they should. None of us are totally happy with our bodies, are we? But that is part of the effects, the curse of sin. But that's why Jesus' rescue is so incredible. His restoration project, it includes the physical. It includes creation. It includes our bodies. So God doesn't get rid of our bodies and say, well, I'll I'll just give up all all this body stuff. It just causes too much trouble. Let's just have a spiritual life. Nor does he even simply repair our bodies back to, as it were, what they were like for Adam at the start in Eden. He goes better than that. He upgrades them to his resurrection body, a body that can never corrupt or fail. So what we see in Jesus' resurrection is the future breaking in to the present. We see here in what we've read there in John a glimpse of the future. It's like a sort of trailer for a film. But it is future. We are not there yet. Jesus is raised, but we are not yet. First, there is still death. There is still waiting for Jesus' return. That is when those who trust in Jesus will have their resurrection bodies. So yes, there is something future here. We don't have all this now. But this is where we're going to finish. We can begin to experience the benefits of Jesus' resurrection now. The sun has risen. There is light now. There is the light of faith. Faith is not a feeling, it's trusting in Jesus, the real Jesus. It's based on who he is and what he's done. It's based on facts. So John here, we're told, he he went in the tomb and he saw and believed. He saw the reality of an empty tomb. It didn't depend on how he felt, you know, whether the tomb was empty or not. It wasn't about whether he he sort of felt it was empty. It was either empty or it wasn't, and he saw it was empty based on facts, independent of how he felt. Mary saw Jesus, and she believed. It's a contrast to Eve, isn't it? She saw, but didn't believe what God had said. She didn't trust. Well, this is different. The resurrection is a sort of bedrock for our faith. You know, so often when I've been tempted to doubt, you know, can I really believe this stuff? Or you just think, well, what is going on here? You know, is it really worth it? I always come back to this simple fact. Look, there's loads I don't get. There's loads I don't understand. But I know this one thing. Jesus is alive. The tomb was empty. People did see him. That's a bedrock for your faith. Because it doesn't depend on how you feel. We'll say more on this next time, but it's, it's, it's also the basis for the sort of light of understanding. Think of what the disciples had experienced in these days that, that preceding. It was a bit like being in the initial creation, those, the first moments of creation where it's formless and empty. It's very disappointing, actually, and it's chaotic. Well, that's pretty much what events had seemed like to the disciples. What on earth is going on here? Our Messiah has just been crucified. But the light of the resurrection begins to bring understanding of God's purpose. 
It says in verse 9, they still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead, that there was more still to understand, there was more to learn. But it began with seeing the empty tomb. And it's the same for us. When we wonder, why is this happening? What is going on? We begin with the resurrection, but there is more to come. We will one day see Jesus face to face. Then we will know fully, to echo the words we were looking at last week. And they, as you'll see, connect with these three headings here. I've just reversed them. Faith, hope, and love. We see love here. Jesus, what does he say? He turns to Mary and he says, Mary. He calls her name. She was looking for Jesus, but it's Jesus who finds her. He's the good shepherd who knows his sheep by name. And there's no fear here. When Jesus meets the disciples, he tells them not to fear. Fear belongs to the night, doesn't it? Not now the sun is risen. So different to Adam in the presence of God. He was afraid, he was guilty. Pilate was rightly afraid in the presence of Jesus. But not those who trust Jesus. Jesus has paid for sin. He has, he has, chosen, he has chosen Mary. He doesn't change his mind. She is safe. Mary doesn't actually need to hold on to Jesus because Jesus won't lose his grip on her. And there's no need to fear death or any trial or of losing your salvation because we are kept by a living Savior who has conquered death. Romans 8.35, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. That's what the resurrection tells us. We see the depth of Jesus' love here, the lengths he has gone to as he bears the curse of sin on the cross to save. Jesus, is, Jesus being alive now is the guarantee of what he has done, the guarantee of his love. And it means we have hope. Twice Mary is asked, why are you crying? That's not a question asking for information. It's saying there's no need to cry. Because what was she crying about? Well, Jesus is both dead and missing. Well, that wasn't true. The hope she should have was based on fact, not wishful thinking. <laughs> the very person she was worried about was talking to her. And so Jesus here is saying, you know, in that question, why are you crying? He is saying there is an end to tears. If Jesus isn't alive, there's every reason to cry. It is a hopeless end. It's downhill all the way. If Jesus is alive, there is endless hope. Because the repairman is here. Yes, there are tears. There are tears now. There is suffering now. Weeping does remain for a night, but joy comes in the morning. The sun is risen. There is the light of hope, which means Christians are the ultimate optimists. Things can only get better in the end. A pessimistic Christian is a contradiction in terms. Jesus has won, and he's won a future that is better than Eden. Well, in the first of these messages we had on John, it had, had the title, How Can This Man Help Us? I really do hope the answer to that question is clear in the light of this morning. To see just how great Jesus is. Light and life is found in the crucified and risen Jesus. Go to him for repair. Let's finish with a final song that brings together just about everything. You've got creation, humanity, the cross, the resurrection, the new creation, all in one song. 
And let's stand and sing this together. Creator God. I am making everything new. Our Heavenly Father, you have whetted our appetite this morning for this new future, for what Jesus has purchased for his people. We thank you that this is what we can enjoy 
is his bride, that he truly gives life. Lord, we pray that what, we, what you have said to us this morning would not be forgotten. We pray that this would change us. Just as you have changed the world, may you change us. May we be different because Jesus is alive. May we have that true faith and trust in him. May we know your love. May we have that hope in him. May we want to serve him all our days and may we have that expectation, that longing for that day when he will come again. Help us to see that that is our ultimate home, the new creation, the new earth. And there we will see Jesus himself in that resurrected body. He will come and walk with us and eat with us and talk with us that what the disciples enjoyed in those brief days, that first Easter, we will be able to enjoy for a whole eternity. Lord, make these things real to us. May we trust you today, and may we keep on trusting you. Thank you that Jesus is alive, and we pray this in his name. Amen.